that. Um, because, I mean, I could show you the image tag in, in a couple of minutes and be done with it, but I, I think we need to talk uh, more about that. Um, first of all, um, the old proverb is that a picture is worth a thousand words. That's true, but there's sort of uh, a corollary to that when it comes to the web development word, world, and that is that a picture better be worth at least a thousand words because a picture takes up thousands of time of space as text does. All right. So therefore, you need to be careful about putting images on the page because that increases the, the, the size of the page. Um, because when the user requests a web page that has an image on it, the user gets, again, multiple files will be sent to them. The HTML page will be sent to them, as well as the, the image file will be sent to them. And it can add up. Now, one thing that you might be thinking is, is in today's world, um, internet connections are typically faster than they've been in the, in the past. You know, not too many people are dialing up on a 2400 baud modem where displaying images takes a half hour. However, bandwidth is always a consideration, especially when you talk about mobile devices, because mobile devices typically don't have the good bandwidth uh, of, of uh, other things. In addition to that, in addition to um, bandwidth considerations, um, there are considerations of clutter on your page. All right. Um, a few well-chosen images can really improve your page, can make it more visually interesting, and in fact, can provide additional information you know, uh, about that. You know, it's, it's not quite the same to read a text, uh, you know, to read text about someone catching the winning touchdown uh, in the Super Bowl as opposed to seeing a photo of it. That, there, there's, there's more immediacy, there's more connection, there's more emotional. In addition, you know, they talk, uh, folks talk a lot about an individual's learning style and so on. There, there's people that respond better to images than text. Um, therefore, carefully chosen images can really enhance your web page. That being said, there's always the, the, the sense of, of the potential for overkill. Even with the CSS that I taught you in the last couple of classes. You know, as Spider-Man says, with great power becomes great responsibility. We've now given you the power to change the color of every single tag in HTML. You know, please use your power wisely. And don't go crazy and think just because I can change the color on every tag, all right, I'm going to go and do that. Do it once, get it out of your system, then delete the file and, and, and start doing it for real. Um, the, the, the analogy sometimes that people have, maybe I'm, maybe, maybe I'm the only person that uses this analogy, but it's like the, the all-you-can-eat buffet. You see the all-you-can-eat buffet, and people take that as a challenge, right, to literally see all that you can eat. You know? um, and it's similar with web development. You know? um, people tend to, when they see what their capabilities are, tend to want to exploit and push those capabilities to the edge. That's not always good design. Good design is about selecting what you're going to put in to maximize your message and to maximize the communication. And so it's that way with colors. It's that way with images as well. Um, if I have, if all of the, the text on my page is black and plain, and if I have one section of the page that is in red text and in italics, that's going to stand out. All right? Because I've carefully chosen and I've carefully indicated, hey, this is somehow different. So it's being emphasized. If I make every paragraph or if I use 10 different colors on my page, then nothing stands out. And the user, the, the viewer of the page loses track of what's supposed to be important and what isn't. Similar thing with images. You know, a few carefully chosen images can really help a user and, and really give a better picture. And there's all kinds of great reasons for using images. However, if you add 
dozens of pictures to the page, you're going to divert their focus from perhaps what's the most important stuff on their page. You know, um, I've always wanted to have, you know how there was like Murphy's Law and there's Newton's Law, you know. I don't put myself in category with Newton. Maybe, maybe with New, maybe with Murphy, I can maybe maybe be on that level. But um, Zeller's law of web design is anything that you put on a page has a potential to distract people from everything else on your page. Which means that the more you put on, if you're putting on something that really adds value, then great. If you're putting on something though that doesn't add value and doesn't add a lot of value. You're doing two things. You're making the download of the page be slower, all right, and you're potentially distracting uh, people. Um, famous uh, fashion designer Coco Chanel once said that, talking about like someone, uh, like a woman going to a fancy ball, you know, she should, before she goes, look at her jewelry and take one item of jewelry off. All right. The reason for that is if you are covered in jewelry, then everything sort of blends together. If you carefully choose the items, then, then that really has emphasis and that really, really pops. And, and, and really you have the effect that way. So we're talking about fashion today. No, we're talking about web design today. And in carefully choosing our stuff, you know, that's really what design is, is choosing the stuff that's going to maximize your message, choosing the colors, choosing the images, and so on. Okay, so with that as a prefix uh, of this, let's talk about how you can obtain images. And this isn't a trick question, all right? You're doing a website, and for now, let's assume that you're not doing it for a class project. We'll talk about for a class project in a minute. But let's say that you are opening a business and you want to create a website. How do you get the images for it? Okay, number one is you can go and you can take the pictures yourself. You know, you might like be saying like, well, yeah, of course you're gonna do that, all right? But there's more possibilities than that. What are some of the other possibilities? Purchase them. Okay, you can purchase what are called stock photography. And stock photography would be where people take, uh, photographers take, professional photographers take um, some fairly generic images, all right? And they put them out there available and then you can go and use them. Now, what's the advantage and disadvantage of that? Well, if you're taking a photograph, you know, you can take the photograph of exactly what you want. If you're buying a stock photo, you have to buy a stock photo that might not be exactly what you want, but it's close enough. For example, let's say I was making a gym. You know, my home, my, my, the business I was creating was a gym. All right. If I went down to my gym, I could actually take a picture of my gym and the weight facilities and someone working out on my machine. So there's some value to that. If I were to purchase a stock photo for it, all right. Um, I might get someone working on a machine like I have, but it wouldn't actually be my machine. All right. Now, what would be the advantage of stock photos is these are the work of professional photographers. Or possibly, you know, sometimes they call them like pro-am, people that aren't necessarily make their living at being a photographer, but are, are really high-level amateurs or, or high-level hobbyists. Um, that uh, sell their work on the internet. The internet actually knocked the bottom out of the stock photography industry because back in the old days before there was the internet, like if you were making a magazine or something, you would go and photographers would charge you a pretty penny for those stock images. All right. Um, why? Well, because it, it, it was hard to take pictures and develop the film and print them and, and get good quality and all that. Now the, the technology, the cameras have, have uh, changed so much and the quality of the cameras have changed so much and are relatively inexpensive. And editing tools are relatively inexpensive that if you have someone that takes a little bit of time and a little bit of practice, not saying they're going to be a professional photographer, but they can make reasonable quality photos and if it's not your job you know if it's something you're doing just for laughs you know yeah, you don't have to charge as much and you're still making a little bit of money there all right so really the internet uh, uh, clobbered stock photography so you can go and you can you the, the bottom line is that you could take the pictures yourself you could purchase them from stock photography 
Sometimes there's royalties associated with it. Sometimes there's royalty free, which means if you buy something royalty free, means you can you have the use of it, and you don't have to like pay every time you use it. You can you just pay a flat amount. Are there other ways to get them? Uh, you say public domain? Is there a yeah, public domain or public domain would be like anything that was. And again, I'm not a lawyer here, but anything that's older than a certain amount, any work of art or music or uh, whatever is um, considered to be in the public domain after the copyright expires. Now, the law is becoming more and more uh, expansive as far as covering copyright laws. So, but like, for example, some of the earliest photography, you know, I've seen like photographs of Abe Lincoln or whatever. Those by now are in the public domain, which means you don't have to pay anyone for it. You know, even though someone took it, and for a period of time someone owned the copyright on that, you can use that uh, for free. The other thing that, that is similar to public domain, but not identical, is what is called Creative Commons licensing. Is anyone familiar with that? Has anyone heard of Creative Commons licensing? Creative Commons licensing is where the person that creates the content sort of gives a blanket um, approval for use of it in different contexts. All right? It's sort of the reverse of copyright. Copyright more or less says you can't use this, you can't use my image unless I explicitly give you permission. Creative Commons says, hey, I'm blanket giving these permissions to it, and you can use it as long as you don't violate these permissions. You don't have to ask me. Now, with Creative Commons, you can license it in several different ways. You can license, for example, that uh, anyone can use it, all right? Or you can say that only non-commercial entities can use it. So, for example, if I had some photographs, maybe I would license them for non-commercial use, which means that if a person wanted to put a picture of mine on their personal web page, they're welcome to do it. If, if, if a school wanted to do it for their class website, they could do it. If a charity wanted to use it for their nonprofit website, they could do it. But if a business wanted to use it for their website, they wouldn't be allowed to do it. So I can license it for non-commercial usage of it. Or I can license it for commercial and non-commercial. I can say, yeah, go ahead. You know, you can use it. I can require attribution. And typically that's what people, that, that's sort of what's, what's working here. Someone will put out some Creative Commons uh, material and require attribution. That way, it's sort of building a portfolio. They can say, hey, look, my work, you know, if, you, if I went for a job as a photographer somewhere, I could say, my work was featured on this website, all right? You know, I gave it away and sort of building up a portfolio that you could go and market. Or you can make some of your photos licensed with Creative Commons and then attract business and then try to sell some other ones. So there, there, there's reasons uh, for doing that. But for some people, it's, it's simply an ego boost. You say, yeah. You know, yeah, go ahead and use my picture. Let's put my name on it because I like seeing my name. <laughs> All right? And who doesn't? You know, who wouldn't want to see a credit on a website of something they've taken? So you can require attribution also. The other thing you can do is you can allow derivative works to be made of your work. And that might be, uh, I suppose that's relevant for photographs. You know, I might license my photograph. Uh, and allow derivative works, which means that someone could go and manipulate it and, you know, make sort of a collage out of it. And, and that's allowable. You see that a lot with music. I may, may license a, a guitar part and I say that I'm allowing derivative works, which means that someone can sample my guitar part and include it in a piece that they make. All right. So there's all sorts of uh, variability. I like to introduce this because it's something that a lot of people don't know about, all right, uh, Creative Commons. And especially if you're a small business, and maybe you're not a professional photographer, or maybe you don't have great photography equipment, or you don't think you have a good eye for photography, all right, 
you can go and you can use some of these things, even if you're a commercial business, as long as you follow the correct Creative Commons licensing and, and find things that have been um, permitted to be used for commercial purposes. So it's, it's a good tool to have in your tool belt. All right. The advantage, again, is similar to stock photography. It might not be quite the high level of professional uh, photography, but some of it is really good work. You know, you might have to wade through it a little bit. Mechanically speaking, how you go, you go to Google Images and you find something yeah. and you click on it, let's say. Yeah. I'll show you an example using Flickr, which is one of the most popular um, services for, for things, but, but other search engines will have, a lot of search engines will have built into it a feature to say, show me only Creative Commons licensed images. So, so we'll take a look at that. We might look at a little bit at stock photography uh, as well. All right. Now, the discussion up to now has been using images, um, assuming that you're doing a personal website or an organization's website. In the academic world, you have a little more flexibility. You can use copyrighted images, provided you don't take too many from a source and you give attribution. And there's a handout on Angel about use of, of materials in an educational context that you should review. So, for example, if you were uh, doing a, a, a web page about the Cleveland Browns, you could go to the Browns website and use one of their images, provided it's for a school project. If it's not for a school project, if you were creating a personal page and you wanted to say, hey, I like the Cleveland Browns and put that on there, that would, strictly speaking, be illegal. Whether they would prosecute you for it or not, you know, is another issue, you know. And I know people do it all the time, but, you know, to Quote my mom, if, if everyone jumped off the bridge, would you do that too? You know, no. You know, so we're, we're going to look at what's legal and not legal. We're not going to say, well, people are doing it. And just because people do it doesn't mean it's, it's legal and fair. Yes? Are you going to show us the proper way of designating someone's name? Like, do you do it at the bottom of the page? Or are you um, to get to that? I don't know if there's a legal requirement when it says attribution. So as long as... I, I my view is as long as you make an effort, okay. you know, I'll show you how I would do it and then uh, again, you know, I don't know if there's like, it's not like there's like a, the APA style, you know, like a, an approved style that it has to be this format, you know. If it says attribution and you put some sort of attribution, for my purposes, that's good enough for me. Okay, that, that even said thank you very much to... Yeah, and that's fair. The other thing you can do is you can kind of make a credits page. And, and link to it on the footer, photo credits, go here. You know, a lot of flexibility as far as, as how you do that. All right, let's look at, I'm always, I'm confused because this microphone looks like a mouse. I was about to move it around and um, they shouldn't do that to me. You know, I, I'm easily confused. All right, let's go and look for some stock photography. So let me search for stock photography and I stock photo. They mentioned this is royalty free. All right? Which means again that you will you will pay for the right to use it. You won't necessarily have to pay like every time you use it. Um, and again, what you can do is look for category. You know, let's say again I was making a gym. We'll continue that example. I could search for different things that I want to include. Well, let's see what looks good. Yeah, this, this looks good, whatever they're doing. And again, this is how much it is to purchase it. And you're not purchasing the image, you're purchasing effectively the rights to use that image. And it, it varies with the size, depending on what you're using it for. If, for example, you wanted to use this like in a poster, all right, you'd probably get the extra, extra large size, which is like megapixels, you know, um, is, is 3,700 by 5,600 pixels. So it's really big. It's a, it's a 13 megabyte image. So that's a big image, all right, which would sort of be overkill on a web page, all right. But if you were like printing a poster, it might be appropriate for that. And that's only 49 bucks, all right? If you compare that with buying a, a camera or hiring a professional photographer to come in 
that I guess that's another option, an extreme option, and so on, then that's probably a pretty good deal for that as compared to your other options to get this quality of a photo. All right. Um, they go between uh, pixels and images. This would be as big as, at, at 300 dots per inch, this would be like a foot by 18 inches. So it would be a pretty good size thing for a poster. So that's stock photography. We're not going to go and do that and, and download this or pay it because I don't have any money. All right? But if you did, you'd go you know, and buy it and then you could use it. All right. Let's go and let's do, first of all, let's do a Google Images search. Because I'm pretty sure in the advanced search, I'm pretty sure in the advanced search, there is the option for copyright. I do not see that here. Let's let's look for um Nautilus machine. Here, let's see. Search settings. That's more general. Let's go back to advanced search. All right, here we go. Ah, down here at the bottom, we have usage rights, which allows us to specify um, what kind of licensing we want. So, I can, check not, I can check not filtered by license, which means it's going to return me every image that Google can find, irrespective of whether it's a copyrighted image or Creative Commons or anything like that. So, the options are not filtered by license, free to use or share, free to use or share even commercially, free to share and modify, free to use, share, or modify even commercially. That would be like the least restrictive. That's saying, hey, go ahead and use this. I don't care if you're going to um, you know, edit it and put it in a collage or if you're going to use it for your business or for personal use or whatever. So let's set that advanced uh, option. And Here's what we get. Notice we get a lot less. And notice we don't get any of the weightlifting machine. All right, so there's really none of them that would be usable for this context. And again, we could go in and we could look, we could refine our search, um, maybe, and find something that we want. So within Google, the advanced option, you can filter based on that. A, a site that I use that's very good for uh, images is Flickr. And with Flickr, I can do a search. And it will show me all the images that have been tagged with a certain term. When, when users upload their images to Flickr, they have an opportunity to tag uh, the images as something. Similar if anyone uses like um, Tumblr or Twitter, you can, you can hashtag your, your entries to include something. Um, so let's say I'm going to do, I'll do a search on running, or let's do skiing. It's winter. I do a search. Again, it's going to show me all the pictures relating to skiing. All right. And then I can go to advanced search and I can say, all right, I can only search within Creative Commons licensed content. 
and I can find content to, to use commercially and find content to modify, adapt, or build upon. So in other words, when people upload their images here, they specify, hey, you can use this commercially, you can edit and, and build upon it. All right? And now I'm going to search based on that criteria. Almost all media, when you upload it to sites like this or YouTube, you can specify the license. If you look real close, and maybe, you know, boy, I shouldn't say this, but I, I suppose I'd probably be honored if someone took this effort to do this. But if you look at my lectures on YouTube, they're uploaded with a Creative Commons license, which means that, you know, people can use them. People can edit them if they want to. People can remix them. So if you're bored some weekend, you know, you're, you're legally allowed to do that. Yeah. Now, where does Flickr, where does Flickr get their pictures? Just from individuals. Individuals. It's a photo sharing site. So if you have a blog like this is from Google, hmm? do they take, in your Google blog, do they take your pictures and put them in their album? And do they belong, someone said that whenever you put on the Google site, it belongs to Google. And I'm not, I haven't really gotten a good answer on that. So I'm um, it, like it, it, it. It's not as scary as that sounds. The question is if you if if you upload it, if you upload it, they they don't take they don't take ownership of it. They don't take ownership of the copyright. Typically, when you upload to a service like that, you give them the permission to use your pictures in marketing things or, or whatever. That doesn't mean that they can sell your pictures and make profit. You'd have to read the individual user agreement, but, but Instagram lately had a big hubbub about that. They, they tried to rephrase their terms and conditions, and people misread it and panicked and, you know, and all that. Uh, but yeah, if you read the terms and conditions, pardon me? It's a true Reddit. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, well, apparently some people did. Yeah. yeah. No, that that's not Part true. Of me is like, well, hey, if they want me, I don't know, yeah, kind of yeah, that that that's not true. Okay. All and right. Someone's donated these pictures then, or well, yeah, know. someone has gone in when they've uploaded it. They've uploaded. They said, I want to allow other people to use it. So we do a search here. I search for skiing, Creative Commons, and notice what I see. I see a kid in a ski mask. Probably not terribly useful to me. Again, the old saying is you get what you pay for, all right? Which means that these pictures might not be up to the level of the professional photos that you get at a stock photo, you know? If you're charging people for something, you know, you better make sure it's good, all right? If you're giving it away for free, well, yeah, picture of my cat playing with a ball of yarn, yeah, I'll post that and say you can use it for free. Whether it's worth using it for free or not is another question. All right, but occasionally you find a diamond in the rough, as they say. And let's look a few pages, and I'm sure if we look hard enough, we'll see a picture that would be reasonable if we were creating a sporting goods store. Now let's look. That looks like a decent picture. That's yeah, a pretty good picture. All right. So if I was doing a sporting goods store, maybe I would use this. Now if we look at this picture. We can click on the license over here, and it will tell me how this has been licensed. In other words, I am free to share, copy, distribute, and transmit the work, remix, that is adapt the work, and make commercial use of the work under the following conditions. All right, attribution. You must at, attribute the work uh, in a manner specified by the author or licensor, blah, 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 and so on. And again, you could always contact who, who owns this and, and get other permissions to do it. But since we have their approval, I'm going to go, hey, Cleveland State. I'm going to go and I'm going to click under Actions. View all sizes. And I'm going to pick a version of this to put on my web page. All right? I'm going to deliberately pick probably too big of a size. All right? So I'm not going to pick the, the ginormous one, but I'll pick this one, the medium 640. And I'll right mouse and I'll say, 
save image as and I'll save it on my desktop um, I'll save it under first example and I'll call it ski Okay, so now it is in this first example page. All right, and let's go in and I'll make a new page for our image practice. And I'll create the tag for our image. We'll say this is our winter sports page. This is some website, huh? It talks about the Constitution and winter sports and all sorts of things. So under winter sports, I'm going to create an article for skiing. So now I have to put the image tag. All right. Finally, we're going to do we're going to mess with the tag. All right. The image tag is the IMG tag. IMG. Now, just like with a web page with a link tag with the anchor tag, we have to specify well, G a link to what. When I put the image tag in, I have to specify what's the image that I want. All right. What is the name of the image that I want. So I have to give the file name. Now, images can be of several different types, several different types on the web. There can be JPEG images, there can be GIF images, and there can be uh, PNG images. They all have their strengths and weaknesses as, as a format. Typically, photographs will either be PNG, PNG or um, JPEG images. All right. But the point is, is you need to know exactly what kind of image it is. How do you know what kind of image it is? You know by the file extension. So this one, this file, again, is called ski.jpg. Even if you know it's a JPEG file, all right, some, JPEG, but some JPEGs end in JPG, some end in JPEG, some end in JPE. All right. Typically, it's either JPG or JPEG, but you even get an eyeball every now and then that, that ends in a JP, JPE. So you have to know that extension. All right. And again, by default, Windows, that extension is turned off. So, and I can show anyone that doesn't know how to do it in the lab, how to do it in Windows 7, but typically, you'll see this. I would suggest always turning your extensions on when you're doing web development so you're absolutely sure of the complete proper file name. How you do it, again, is a little bit different depending on the version of Windows. You go to Folder Options, View, you uncheck where it says Hide Extensions. All right, and now I can see it's a JPG. So, what I'll do is image, I'll put in the source attribute, and assuming it's in the same folder as my HTML page, all I have to do is put the name of the image file, the, the file name, which in this case is ski.jpg. All right. There is another attribute
that has a couple of purposes, and that is the alt text attribute. The alt text attribute is used by screen readers if a person visiting this page is visually impaired and can't see the image. The screen reader will actually read them the caption. Well, well, not the caption, but will read the alt text to them. The other reason it's used is if for some reason, accidentally, that image got deleted off the web server, the alt text would appear and at least show the person what they were going to see. In the old days, people would often, if they were browsing on, on a very slow connection, would often turn off images via their browser. And the alt text gave them then a description of what the image is, and then they could go and individually pick it and see it. That's not quite as popular uh, of a practice as it used to be. All right. But anyhow, that's the image tag. Now, strictly speaking, an image tag doesn't have to have an ending tag. But I always like to put ending tags there. All right. So I'll show you two alternatives you can do. One is you can just put the start uh, image tag and the end image tag right next to each other with nothing in between them. And that kind of looks a little dumb, right? What you can do then is you can do this. And I can put a slash before that greater than sign. What that does is that makes this tag a starting and ending tag rolled into one. All right, this is what's called an empty tag. When there's nothing between the start and, and, and ending tag, you can use this syntax where you have the tag name, any attributes, and then a slash and greater than sign at the end. That designates, hey, this tag is self-contained. It's its own ending tag. So any tag where there's nothing between the starting and ending tag, you can do that on. All right. All the tags we've looked at so far, there's been something between the start and ending tag, so we can't do that, right? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at this. That's, these are attributes that are part of the starting tag. They're not inside the tag. Okay. Notice the difference between this there's the H2 tag, less than sign H2 greater than. That's the end of the starting tag, and then there's the word skiing. Here I have less than sign IMG. There is no greater than. So this part over here is still part of the starting tag. It's at no, it's a great question. It's attributes. All right? It's additional information about the tag. And if you go back and look at the examples where we did links, we had the same thing there too. We had less than sign A space href equals. So that's, that, that's part of the starting tag still. All right. So now if we go and look at this, we have our page with our image on it. Right. So to review, image tag. IMG. Two attributes are required for each image tag. An SRC, which indicates the file name, and the alt attribute, which indicates text that will be displayed if for some reason the link to that image gets broken or if someone is accessing this via a screen reader. The image tag is sort of a special uh, a tag in that it is both a starting and ending tag all at once. So we use that syntax where we put the slash greater than over there and that indicates an empty tag. That is a starting and ending tag rolled into one. Yes? Would you use this? No. All right. Well, l let's look at, l let me Google caption because caption's one of them new HTML5 things that I can't quite remember. So let's go and, let's go and Google caption.
Okay. See, that's why I was glad to Google it. short answer is no. If you want to associate a, cap, uh, a caption with an with a image, you enclose the image in a figure tag. And then you use the fig caption tag Put your caption here. And to a question that we had earlier, this might be a good place to put your um, attribution. I'm just going to put a link, Creative Commons License. my figure, and then there's a caption associated with it. You don't have to have a caption with an image. You can just have an image. But if you did want to have a caption, and certainly the, the, the attribution of it would be uh, a good thing possibly to include in the caption, um, you could do it that way. All right. Now, What if the image is too big? All right. Let me tell you what not to do. All right. Generally speaking, you don't want to do this. You know, never say never, but typically there's only certain reasons that you'd want to do this. One thing that you can do is either through your CSS or through your HTML code, you can specify how big you want it to be. All right. Sometimes I wonder, should I even tell you these things if I then turn around and tell you don't do them, all right? But I do notice students do them, so I feel obligated to do it. So I can put a width on this. And there, I made the picture smaller, all right, simply by putting a width attribute. And I could do a similar thing in CSS, but I don't want to do that. Why do I not want to do that? necessarily uh, yeah yeah you're still downloading the bigger picture so you're not really saving any time on the download so in other words this is say 500 pixels wide I think or 600 pixels wide if I displayed only 100 pixels I'm loading all that stuff and then I'm just showing a smaller image well what's the point of that all right is it's not a good idea to do that so you're better off to edit it to be the size that you are going to display it. So if I wanted this to be, say, 100 pixels, all right, I would go in and I would edit the, the image to be 100 pixels. Yes? Uh, well, remember, that all the source is going to show is the name of the file, right? 
Right. It's just literally the text that you've put in. Right. So, what I would do instead of that would be I would go in and I would edit the image. Now, this is not a class in photo editing. There's a multimedia class that we teach that, that has a unit on photo editing. But a lot of people already know a little bit how to edit photos, at least the very basics, like resizing a photo or maybe like fixing the contrast of it or maybe turning this into a black and white image, for example, if, if I decided I wanted to do that. As a web developer and developing web pages, you should know at least the very basics of image manipulation. I don't really care what program you use, so if you have a program that you know, you know, if you have Photoshop, which is a fairly expensive, uh, expensive and extensive program, there's an open source application called the GIMP, which does photo editing for, and it's free. Is it as good as Photoshop? I was going to say, I don't know, but it's infinitely less expensive, all right, because it doesn't cost anything, all right. So again, you're right. It is close to as good as Photoshop, and it's absolutely free. So I mean, that's what I use for photo editing. And then there's a number of other packages, too. You can download free ones. At the very least, and I'm embarrassed to say that, you could use Microsoft Paint. Just to, just to edit it if you didn't want to go through the trouble. So I'll go in here and I will open with paint and I will go into the attributes of the image. No, I don't want to do that. I want to go into stretch skew and I want to change the percentages of it to make it smaller. So maybe I want this to be 15% of its original size. If you use paint, you better change both the vertical and horizontal or you're going to squish your image. All right? And there we go. Now, one word to the wise. If you're going to manipulate an image and make it smaller, save the original first. Right? Why is that? Because you can't make a picture bigger. You can make a picture smaller, but you can't make a picture bigger. When you make a picture smaller, you lose some of the detail. So if you, and you're never going to be able to get that detail back. So if you make an image smaller, then make it bigger again, it'll look pixelated. It won't look like a smooth photograph. It will look more like a mosaic. So I should go out before I save this and copy and save an original of this image. And now I'll go and save it. And now we can go here, and without having anything about the size of the image, it displays the way um, that it should. Yeah. Yeah, if you, if you just change the width in HTML, it will figure out the other one. It'll do it in proportion. If you're using photo, uh, photo editing tool, you better do that yourself. You better make it a constant percentage. The one thing that screams amateurism to me, you know, everyone has their pet peeves. The one thing that screams amateurism to me is when I see a picture whose aspect ratio has been distorted. In other words, if it was, say, a 1,000 by 1,000 pixel image, in other words, it's as wide as it is tall, if when you resize it, you make it 800 by 600, you're going to squash it. Either, either everyone's going to look too thin or everyone's going to look too wide because it's going to squash it down or stretch it out. In either of the two cases, um, that screams amateur to me. All right? so, so avoid doing that at all costs. All right, if you're going to edit it, take care that when you edit it, you keep the original ratio between the height and width. That's called the aspect ratio of an image. So now we have this. And again, all right, there we go. All right. And if I do decide, hey, that's a little small, all right, I can always then go back, delete this guy. Since I deleted the image, now it shows me the broken image there. Um, I can then go and copy and re-edit this guy and make it maybe make it a little bit bigger. 
this time I will use not paint, but um, okay, will this allow me to resize it? Maybe it does. I don't know. There we go. Resize. And I can resize it to a custom width. Right now it is, I don't think that's it. Say I can make it um, 600 by... Right, make it. I think I messed up. Let's use a percentage. Now I'll save it. And now if we look at it, it's a little bit bigger. Now, interesting thing here. If we look at the size of this in bytes, this is like 45 KB. This is 192 KB. You might wonder, I made it like half the size. Why isn't it half? Well, a couple of things. First of all, this is a compressed format. And every time you save it, it recompresses it. Another reason to keep the original, the original again has the full detail. Every time you save it and compress it, you lose some data. You lose data beyond the fact that you're just resizing it. You lose some, some detail in it. Plus, remember, if you're cutting it, you're cutting it both vertically and horizontally. So you're not just cutting it in half, you're actually cutting it in a quarter if you make it 50%. All right. So now we have this, and maybe that's a more reasonable size for this example. All right, we'll talk more about images next time. Uh, if you have difficulty editing images, that's probably best reviewed one-on-one -on -one in lab. I know a lot of people are already, already are capable of this, so I'm not going to cover too much in class. Plus, you really don't need to be an expert. You just need to resize images. Now, there's a second kind of image that you have on web pages. All right, this I would say would be image uh, that really is closely tied to the content of the page. In other words, maybe I'm demonstrating on this page how to turn on my skis. And maybe underneath it I have a paragraph to say when you're turning it, your edges will be in contact, you know, and, and so on and so forth. There's other kinds of images, though, that are more just like decoration or window dressing. All right? And it's valid to do that, it's, so it's okay to do that. You want your page to look good, and therefore you might put some image there that really doesn't add any contact, but makes the page look nicer. You know, maybe we have a nice snowflake pattern in the background, I don't know, all right? Those are images for decoration. So images for content or images like this, images for decoration. And we'll spend a little bit of time talking about what you can do with images for decoration uh, next time. Questions? All right, I will make, yes, go ahead. Well, that's a good question. The question is, is I, I couldn't get it. Okay, you have an image file and you bring that into the HTML. I need both files for it to work. So you have to, that's where it becomes good to zip up the files. All right. For example, let's say, and I need to do this. So let me go in here. I'm going to delete these two pages. And I'm going to assume this is my assignment. So. You work on this, you create your HTML. I'm going to move, get rid of the original. I have my HTML and I have my image. You need that for that to work. All right, there you see the image. When I'm all done, what I will do is I will take this folder and I will zip up the whole folder. So right mouse on it if you're using Windows. 
and say send to compressed folder. That will create a zip file called whatever your folder name is dot zip and that's what you upload. You need to, so you need to send me both files. You need to send me the image and the HTML code. If you were to send me one but not the other, the image will show as a broken link or a broken image. So you need to show me or send me both those files. And the easiest way to do that, especially now is we're going to start adding files. We're going to add CSS files and image files and all that. The easiest thing to do is put everything in a folder, zip up the folder, and send that. And then you upload it. All right. Other questions? Okay. I'm going to go make sure that the lab is open, then I'll come back to grab this example, and then we'll see you over in lab.